Howdy all, and welcome to a short video on functions and function notation. Now, you're probably already familiar with the concept of a function from your previous math experience, but I'd like to take some time just to develop kind of the way I conceptualize functions, talk about some practical examples, and then leave you feeling comfortable with the notation of functions. So I'm drawing a kind of funny picture here of what a lot of people call the function machine. And it just helps us understand what a function is. So I'm gonna call this box here my function machine. And what we're gonna go ahead and do is label the parts of this function. So on the left, I'm going to put uh, the input side, which means when I stick a certain something into my function, the rule of the function does something to that input. And after a little bit of time, the output arrives. So as you've probably worked with in other math classes, we tend to call the input of a function the variable x. Uh, you could let it be anything, but x is a common name of an input. And then often we refer to the output after the function does its work as y or f of x. So whatever comes out of the function is called y or f of x. Now, as we're drawing this picture, I'd like to clarify that the input is really our choice, right? So it's called the independent variable. So we get to pick or choose what we're sticking into this function from whatever is an allowed choice. Um, that'll be another concept we talk a lot more about. But then as a result of that choice, we then gain a dependent variable. So the output depends upon what we stuck into the function. So if you've heard about independent and dependent variables before, hopefully this picture kind of clarifies which one is which. Now, um, the input is highly tied to a concept you've heard of called the domain of the function. So that's gonna be a, a big deal that we talk about. Similarly, the output is tied to the idea of the range. So we'll discuss those in a separate video in more depth, but just putting those out there right away so that we get comfortable with which is which. So hopefully that helps just kind of lay some common ground for all of us. Um, if I asked each of you, what is a function? Um, what would you say? How would you describe a function? Maybe you would use an example, or maybe you have a really clear, concise definition. Let's start with some examples, and then we'll get to a little bit more of a definition together. So I just grabbed a picture that I took uh, not too long ago. Yes, this photo actually was taken in 2020. Corona did some kind of crazy stuff to our gas prices, as I'm sure you're aware. But I thought this would be a nice kind of place to start with what an example of a function could be. So we just talked a minute ago about the idea of a function machine. So I'd like to develop a function machine for the picture that you see there. Um, I'll supply a little bit more information to make it a bit more clear. But um, that's a gas pump um, where I went and got some gas recently. I think this picture was taken maybe end of March, early April. And basically, you can see that there's a certain price per gallon listed there. So you guys would need a little bit more information for me, probably, um, to get a specific function value. Um, so let's say that when I filled up, I got 10 gallons of gas, just to make the math, the mental math easy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call the input in this example the gas, right? And in math, we are often super careful about units. So I'm going to understand that the gas I'm putting in is measured in gallons. So if we input a certain amount of gas, you can guess that a practical output for this model would be uh, the price, right? Or the cost, how much I'm paying. And for us, that's going to be measured in dollars. So again, I tried to use just kind of a, an easy number. So I said, let's, let's suppose that I stuck 10 gallons of gas in, then the rule of this function does what? It actually times is the number of gallons by the price per gallon. And that price per gallon is given, let's round uh, to $1.79 per gallon. 
so that we would understand the cost that I paid when I left was $17.90. So 10 gallons of gas cost me $17.90. So that's, that's a practical example of a function that I think we all can relate to. Um, just to talk about a couple other ones for fun. A lot of times when people ask me, I think about um, the motion of tides, right? If you've ever been to the beach and seen, you know, there's high tides and low tides, that can be modeled by a function. Um, temperature in the city we live in can be modeled by a function. Um, if you've ever given your dog a bath and watched watch the dog shake the water off, that can be modeled by a function. So functions are all around us. Uh, and they can even be a little bit more conceptual and goofy, such as I think about um, a function as how good food tastes on a regular day. And then a function machine could be, well, it's Thanksgiving. So the output is your food always tastes twice as good on Thanksgiving. So just to share a couple little examples that come to mind. But we've also experienced likely some good function notation in previous classes. So let's pose another question. Um, I want to ask us, what's special about a function? There is kind of an important condition for something to be a function. And you might pause and kind of think about what answer you'd give me, um, whether that's in words or through a picture. So the important thing that I want to bring out today is that each possible input, and we'll see if this corresponds to what you were thinking about, each possible input will lead to exactly one output. And that's pretty special. So I'm going to kind of say that's what's special about a function. And then let's explore this a bit more graphically. Um, pictures really help me. I'm, I'm guessing some of you also benefit from a picture. So let's pick on something we know is a function. Um, so I'm going to pick on y equals x squared. You've probably had to graph this before. Um, and from what we said at the beginning, this could also be written as f of x equals x squared, right? y and f of x are interchangeable. So if I want to look at the graph of a function, one thing we'll often do is create a table of values. So I'm going to create a little xy table. This is one way we can graph by hand. And I'm saying this is a function, which means if we pick some inputs, we should be able to find some outputs. Um, the choices for my inputs are kind of arbitrary, right? You can pick whatever you'd like. So I'm going to go ahead and pick, uh, how about negative 2, 0, and 2. You could choose others, and your graph would still appear the same as mine. And then the rule of this function is whatever the input is, simply square it. So you can see that I'm going to take the x value and square it. So when I take my input of negative 2 and I square it, I get an output of 4. When I take the input of 0 and I square it, the corresponding output is actually still 0. And then when we take the input of positive 2 and we square it, we get an output of 4. So from this table of values that I'm showing on the screen, I just created basically three ordered pairs that I could plot on a coordinate plane. And then when I plot those three points and connect them, I would then create the graph of the function. So just to clarify, um, the x comma y ordered pairs would be negative 2, 4, 0, 0, and 2, 4. Because when we talk about ordered pairs, the ordered pairs go x comma y. So just real quick, let's plot these three points. Something you've likely done before, but kind of getting on the same page here. So the horizontal axis is typically what we call the x-axis. The vertical axis typically we call y. And I'm just going to make enough space to plot the three points that we just came up with. So I noticed my x values go as small as negative 2 and as big as 2. So that's why I made enough space uh, in the horizontal direction. 
and then looks like our y values are as small as 0 and as big as 4. So I should have enough space now to plot those three ordered pairs. When x is negative 2, y is 4. So that would be plotted right about there. When x is 0, y is 0. So that's actually what we call the origin. And then when x is positive 2, the y value is again 4. So with those three points I just plotted, again, this is a sketch. It's not perfect. But if I connect those three points, um, my prior experience with this type of function tells me it's going to graph as a parabola. So I, I picked a function that you guys have spent some time with before. Um, so that shape that I just sketched is likely familiar to you. So that would be the sketch of the graph f of x equals x squared. And that is a function. It might not be perfectly clear then what is not a function. So a lot of times what helps me when learning a new definition or understanding a concept is to see something that doesn't satisfy the definition, basically to look at a counterexample. So hang with me for a moment. Let's go ahead and, and look at another a graph, but this time it's going to produce a non-function. And I think that non-function will clarify the function definition. So I'm not um, forgetting this definition that we talked about, but let's put one more example up to clarify it. Okay, so this time all I'm going to do is swap my x and y from the last example. So I'm going to say let's look at x equals y squared. And I've already told you, I kind of already spoiled it, it's not a function. But let's look at the graph to understand why. So similarly, we can create an xy table of values. But this time, when you think about picking x and finding y, that doesn't feel quite as intuitive. Because in this example, um, it's actually the y value that's being squared. So it makes more sense here to actually pick the y's and then find the x's. So I'm going to swap the order of my xy table this time. I can still use those same choices from our last example. So I'm still going to use negative 2, 0, and 2. So it might almost feel like we're doing the same thing for a minute. And then we're just going to go ahead and do what the function says, or the equation, I should say, says, which is whatever we chose for x, uh -oh, whatever we chose for y, take that and square it, and you'll get the x. So it's really flip-flopped from our last example. So I have to be careful not to call it a function for a reason that we'll see shortly. So I stick in negative 2. When I square negative 2, I get out 4. We'll stick in 0. Squaring 0 gives back still 0. And then when we stick in positive 2, squaring that gives us positive 4. So I have to be a little careful, right? It's easy to assume that these three things we just found are ordered pairs. Um, and they are, but watch out for the order, right? Ordered pairs go x comma y. So this first row tells me that when the x value is 4, the y value is negative 2. Because careful, my x column came second here. Uh, the next one is kind of a freebie because x and y are the same, so we can't really mess that up. But don't take it for granted. And then the last row tells me when x is 4, y is 2. All right, so same as before, let's go ahead and plot those points on the coordinate plane. This time, just kind of quick observation, I'm noting that my x values are going to go between 0 and 4, so I'll make enough space to go between 0 and 4 in the x direction. And my smallest y value is negative 2, my biggest y value is 2. So when you're sketching by hand, you just kind of want to keep in mind how much of the graph to show. Um, I get to choose that since I'm drawing it um, from scratch here. All right, so let's plot those points. Um, so this value out here is going to correspond to x being 4. All my tick marks just measure one unit. So when x is 4, y is 2. 
there's roughly that first point. When x is 0, y is also 0, so we get that origin point again. And last but not least, when x is 4, y is negative 2. I guess I just plotted those kind of from bottom to top. So let's connect those points and stare at the resulting graph a little bit. So this would be showing a sketch of x equals y squared. And I said it's not a function. So what about this graph feels different from this last example? Why is the upward facing u shape, or what we call a parabola, a function, whereas the, sideway, the sideways parabola is not? And it goes back to our definition. So let's read through that one more time. And it said, each possible input leads to exactly one output. So m many of you have perhaps heard of the vertical line test. And I think the vertical line test, I'm going to say the VLT, really helps clarify what those words are saying. So again, if you're like me, a picture is sometimes way more helpful. On our first example, which is a function, if I draw vertical lines through that, I never touch more than one point on the function. So this first example passes the VLT, and thus it is a function. If we look at the latest graph that we just drew together, and we draw vertical lines through that graph, you'll notice that I often pass through more than one point, right, when I draw vertical lines. So I would have to say that this graph fails the vertical line test. Uh, and for that reason, it's not a function. So the vertical line test is a really nice graphical way to understand when a relation is a function or not. So. Hopefully that kind of starts bringing back some memories about functions and, and using them a bit. We get to talk about these for many, many weeks. Um, so, well, actually, if you're in the summer class, just five weeks, but um, <laughs> it'll be fun. So functions are great, and tune in to the next video to talk about domain and range.